of Daniel 4 as probably the, the, the most unique chapter in the Bible uh, in one certain way. The reason it's one of the most unique chapters in all the Bible is because it was written by a pagan, by a Gentile, by a Babylonian. It was not written by one of God's people. It wasn't written by a Jew. It wasn't written uh, by someone who was uh, part of God's chosen. It was written by a Babylonian named Nebuchadnezzar. Um, so we see in chapter 4 him telling his story of his interaction with God. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar would speak as one intellectually convinced of the sovereignty of God and the omniscience of God. But there was no real sign that there was a lasting true heart conversion, uh, at least up to this point. Um, and and, and it's, it's, it's good for us to, to remember in the first few chapters of Daniel how God has been revealing uh, himself to Daniel in, in such a way that Daniel should have fallen down and worshipped him uh, with complete surrender of his life. There was the dream that he had that Daniel interpreted. I'm sorry, did I was I saying that God revealed himself to Daniel? How God revealed himself to Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar should have bowed down and, wor and worshipped him. Um, that God was pursuing Nebuchadnezzar in a multitude of ways. Uh, and the, what, the first those we read about um, is when God gave Nebuchadnezzar this dream of this great statue with a head of gold and then a body of uh, silver and then it just goes down through uh, the bronze and iron and whatnot. And Daniel interpreted that uh, to be about the kingdom of Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar, of which ba Nebuchadnezzar was, uh, was the ruler of, and how this rock came uh, untouched by human hands that rolled and destroyed all these kingdoms. Um, and that was the God uh, and his kingdom that would destroy all earthly kingdoms. Um, and God was revealing himself that he was the God, one, that would that would rule and reign, but, but two, uh, that was the God that would reveal mysteries that nobody else could. And so at that, if nothing else, Nebuchadnezzar should have fallen down in worship. Uh, and then there was the, the account that Nebuchadnezzar saw with his own eyes of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not bowing down to the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had erected and commanded worship of. Uh, and he saw with his own eyes, um, as these three were thrown into the furnace, there was a fourth there. And, and he saw that God was a God that controlled all forces uh, and was over all forces, in, in, including fire. Um, that, that he was a God who steps in sometimes and rescues his people by miraculous means. Um, but, but Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't, there was no lasting change in him. And so he had to learn it the hard way. And, and that's what we're going to see today. Um, and he's going to find himself stripped of all authority, stripped of all power, stripped of his um, of his reason, stripped of all human feature, uh, and finally realize his weakness and his folly between or his folly before the God of the Hebrews, the one true God. So it's a long chapter. I'm just going to read it as we go through it, uh, verses one and two. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. It's my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. So this is Nebuchadnezzar saying, one, I wish you all prosperity, I wish you all well, but two, it's my pleasure to tell you about how I have experienced God and the miraculous uh, signs and wonders that he's performed uh, in my life and around me. Um, Nebuchadnezzar is issuing this decree in his own name. This is coming at his hand, and he is ascribing honor to God. Uh, it, he was humbling himself before the people and he's finally realizing his responsibility as a leader for the welfare of those people in his domain and in his kingdom. Um, he, he was responsible that uh, that the poor would not be taken advantage by the w rich. He was responsible to make sure that those who were going without um, didn't go without unnecessarily. Um, in verse 1 he says, May you prosper greatly. Uh, he's realizing that he has a responsibility in the kingdom to make sure that all of his subjects are prosperous and have the opportunity to be prosperous. And verse 2, he confesses that he has personally seen the hand of God in miraculous ways um, and that this God is like any other God before. Uh, verse 3, how great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. 
Uh, wh when he uses the, the phrase, how great are his signs, he means literally how great are his attesting miracles, that these miracles that God has done are for the attesting of his sovereignty and his power and of his dominion and rule. Um, through this ordeal, Nebuchadnezzar is finally going to realize uh, that God alone is the source and has the source of all power and authority over human or, 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 or over nature and humanity and history, um, and that no one rules and no one reigns apart from God's permission. It's all at the permission of God. He sets up and He takes down, and He gives it to whomever He wishes. Nebuchadnezzar is going to finally learn that. In verse four and five, Nebuchadnezzar tells his story. He says, "I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home, uh, at home in my palace, contented and prosperous." I had a dream that made me afraid, and as I was lying in my bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. And so he's in his at his palace, just lying down, complete, completely contented, completely at peace. All his foes have been vanquished, um, and he's just thinking, who can touch me? And he has this dream that absolutely shocks him to the core of his being. Uh, verses 6 and 7. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon uh, be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Um, he said, I called all the, all the people that asked to interpret the first dream, and they couldn't do it. I asked them all to come in and, and interpret this dream for me. The interesting thing is, at least he tells the guys the dream this time. Last time, he said, hey, I had this dream. Tell me what it was and tell me what it means. This time, at least he says, here's what it was. I just want you to tell me what it means. I, I'm, I'm so scared. I just want an answer. I'm, I don't want any tricks. I just want an answer. Um... And this, uh, these astrologers are listed there. Um, in verse 7, uh, the literal word for that is Chaldeans. And someone asked the question, uh, these Chaldeans, here were they? Well, th there's two different things uh, to know about the Chaldean. One, it's an ethnic group. In other words, it's, it's, it's another word for these Babylonians. But it's also a term of their function, which is, is astrologers. And so these are, these are little uh, fortune tellers. And so they said they couldn't tell me the dream. Verse 8, finally Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. And he adds this kind of in parentheses. He is called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. He knows something's different about, about Daniel. He calls Daniel Belteshazzar. That was this Babylonian name that, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar changed his name to in honor of his Babylonian god, uh, Baal. And it literally means Baal protects his life. Um... But anyway, he tells Daniel this dream because he knows there's something different about Daniel. The spirit of the gods is in him, he says. Verses 9 and following, I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. And so now, now he's going to tell the dream. Uh, I looked and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it the beasts of the field found shelter, and the birds of the air lived in its branches. From it every creature was fed. And so he said, that I, this dream I saw this huge tree, and it was, it was, it was, it was huge, it was abundant. The, the, the birds lived in it, the creatures slept under its shade it gave food to be it was a blessing to the earth it was an absolute blessing to the earth um but it goes on in the visions i saw while lying in my bed i looked and there before me was a messenger a holy one coming down from heaven he called in a loud voice cut down the tree and trim off its branches strip its leaves and scatter its fruit let the animals flee from under it uh, and the birds from its branches but let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth let his mind be changed uh, from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him um it's interesting that the vision starts about a tree and then it turns to a stump but immediately that stump is called a hymn and immediately it takes on this human person. Um, and, and Nebuchadnezzar says, I saw this messenger come down from heaven. This is an interesting passage. Literally, he, it, it means I saw an angel. But the term that it uses for messenger or angel is peculiar. 
uh, because it means watchman. He says, I saw this watchman. Um, and it, it, it comes from the verb of one to be on the watch. And so there, there's one who is on the watch for something, for someone. Uh, this is the only time this, the, this particular word is used in all of the Bible. We see it one other time in, a, in the Genesis scroll from one of the caves in the Qumran, uh, one of the Qumran caves. And talking, and it talks about it uses the same word, but it translates it as angel rather than messenger. Uh, but regardless, it indicates this is a this is unique, um, at least a unique function, if not a unique entity. Uh, there are some that would suggest that there are classes of angels, and certainly we see the idea of seraphim and cherubim, or seraphs and cherubs, and they have different roles in the heavenly realm. But uh, the, the, there were some that would say that there's a quite an extensive cast or class of angels and this would be a special class charged with the um, with the executing uh, the judgment decrees of God and so uh, it's just an idea who knows but it, but it is a particular a peculiar word and and this this judgment is pronounced and and says it will last seven times um, and so seven times pass by or as so what it means is for it's going to last for seven years uh, and 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 it goes on in verse 17 and 18. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict, so that the living may know. Here's the purpose of the whole dream, right here. So that the living may know. Those who are alive, those who are on earth, may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men, and gives them to anyone He wishes, and sets over them the lowliest of men. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men of my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. And so he says, this is what it was. Tell me what it means, because nobody else seems to be able to do it. Um, the purpose of this whole of this whole dream, the purpose of this, this whole experience for Nebuchadnezzar uh, is uh, so that he and others will know that there's the most high God, who uh, rules over all things and all people and sets up uh, rulers and tears them down and sometimes sets up the lowliest of people to be rulers. Um, that we are not necessarily captains of our own fate and masters of our own soul, that we are um, under the discretion and the rule and the sovereignty and the hand of God. It's God who chooses who wears the crown it's God who chooses who does not wear the crown. And sometimes, according to what Nebuchadnezzar is learning, what we see in the Bible, is that sometimes God selects the lowliest of people. Um, that may explain the last couple of United States uh, presidential elections. Uh, and, and, and maybe that would uh, help us to remember that we maybe shouldn't get so worked up about politics. Be involved, absolutely. Cast your vote. Do everything that we have the privilege of doing. Um, but maybe not get too worked up about it. Maybe it's not worth storming the castle over. Um, God's the one setting people up and tearing people down. That has profound implications to our response of uh, the person in the White House, however you feel about the last one or the current one, or the VP, or those in the Senate and the House. God set them up. God will take them down when he wants to. Just let God be God. But the idea that this prideful man is portrayed by a lofty tree is a familiar Old Testament symbol. Isaiah 2, Isaiah 10, Ezekiel 31 all talk about the idea of a, the prideful man being as a great and enormous tree. So the fact that these non-Hebrews couldn't interpret this dream may be because they didn't understand the Hebrew Old Testament symbolism. And so they just didn't, they just didn't get it. Could be. Although it could be that, um, given the interpretation that we'll learn about what this dream was about, none of them wanted to dare broach the subject with the king. And so they just played dumb. Better be dumb than dead, they figured. Uh, so Nebuchadnezzar tells Daniel, look, Daniel, I know you're special. I know you've got the spirit of the gods or, or, or the, the, the God's spirit in you. So for Daniel, God's honor was at stake. And so he had to tell the king the interpretation. Uh, and so Daniel starts off, verse 19. 
Then Daniel, also, also, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not uh, let the dream nor its meaning alarm you. But the Shazar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field, and get, having nesting places in all its branches for the birds of the air, you, O king, are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. So Nebuchadnezzar, or sorry, Daniel starts, uh, and he's very loyal to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar has been very good and gracious to Daniel. And Daniel honestly wants the best for Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and and he, Daniel starts with, look, um, you want to know what it says? I'll tell you. I wish it said it about your adversaries and enemies. I wish it didn't say it about you, but this dream is about you. And so Daniel starts in uh, with the idea that, um, that uh, yeah, it's a dream of your greatness initially. Uh, but before Daniel even gets to the interpretation, the Bible says he was, he was perplexed for a time. Um, literally, he was stupefied for one hour. Now, whether it's literally 60 seconds, I don't know, but it is a time where he is absolutely stupefied uh, and absolutely silent. He does not want to say anything. He doesn't want to be a part of this. He doesn't want to do this. Um, he does, he's not quite sure exactly what to say. Uh, but he goes on with the interpretation. Verse 23. You, O king, saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump, bound with iron and bronze, in the grass of the field, while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched, drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live like the wild animals until seven times pass. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against the Lord, uh, my Lord the king. You will be driven away from your people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for sometimes will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge the he that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. He said, that was the interpretation. Let me give us some advice now. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Um, Nebuchadnezzar apparently is not just going to lose his position and not just lose his sanity. Uh, he's, he's going to lose all mental and physical faculties of what it means to be human. It'll be reduced to a beast. Not even able to be contained in a cage, just left to roam in the wilderness. And this humiliation of the king is going to be long enough to teach Nebuchadnezzar to respect God's sovereignty. And I wonder how many times that God puts us in positions of humility or even anguish or despair or great need so that we will acknowledge his sovereignty so be under no guise and no uh, deception that we are capable in and of ourselves Nebuchadnezzar will learn that it's God who sets up and God who tears down and it's all at God's prerogative alone, and Nebuchadnezzar will learn to praise this God. Nebuchadnezzar will learn that he answers to God and to God alone, the one true God of the Hebrews, the God of Daniel, the God of Meshach, and of Shadrach, Abednego. He will learn that Nebuchadnezzar is frail, that he's weak, and that at best, he's only a temporary instrument in the hands of Yahweh. This is a great lesson for us all to remember. Maybe, if we remember that, we wouldn't think so highly of ourselves nor our position. 
And I guarantee you that if we remember that truth, we'd be less offended by others because we'd be less disgusted that they may offend us. Because after all, we're nothing but a frail, temporary tool in the hands of, of an almighty God. So just let him be in control. Verse 26, when it says that this stump will be left in the ground with his bands around it, but it'll be kept in place. And it means that Nebuchadnezzar eventually is going to be restored. He's not being removed completely, just enough to be able to teach him a lesson so he'll learn. I mean, in this type of monarchy, it's incredible that after seven, during those seven years, some leader didn't raise up and, uh, and try to take his place and usurp his authority. After all, he's out in the fields anyway. What's he know? Uh, but apparently there was no one who was worthy, no one who was credible, so they, and apparently they wanted Nebuchadnezzar, so they just waited. Um, and I love verse 27. That Daniel says, Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept this advice, my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what's right. Renounce your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. And it may be that then your prosperity will continue. What, Nebu what, what Daniel's saying here is sometimes... We get in these positions of pain, of difficulty, of distress uh, because of our sin. Not all the time, not at all all the time. Matter of fact, Jesus was walking around one time and there was someone who was born blind and he was asked, who sinned, uh, him or his parents, that he's blind? Jesus said, none of them sinned. The, uh, uh, he's blind so that I could show my dominion in this world. And so... So sometimes bad things happen just because bad things happen. And prayerfully, God reveals his dominion, his sovereignty, and, 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 and his kingdom shows up. Your kingdom come on earth as is in heaven. But sometimes bad things happen and difficulty and sin and, or difficulty and sickness and disease happen because of sin. Uh, and certainly in this case with Nebuchadnezzar, this was the encouragement from Daniel. You sinned. You're practicing sin. You're not repenting of it. Repent, and maybe God will heal. This is this is very similar to what what we're told in the book of James, James chapter five. If I can just turn there real quick, James chapter five, um, starting in verse fourteen. Is anyone un, is any one of you sick? You should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. If you're sick, call them, the elders of the church. Let them come pray over you and anoint you with oil. And then it gets specific. Confess your sins to each other uh, and then be healed. The idea that one will be anointed with oil... Uh, carries with it the idea that one has confessed their sin and they're right before God. To anoint something with oil was 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 a sign of holiness. To make it holy, that it is holy, consecrated and set apart. Um, and so the idea that one would come over to a sick person and anoint them with oil means that they have confessed their sins. That's why that poor passage of James in verse 16 says, Confess your sins, therefore. And pray for another to be healed. Like the confession of sin has to happen first. And so that's that's what Daniel's saying. In the instances, not that everyone is, but in the instances where the sickness or the difficulty is because of sin, the first thing we do is confess our sin and get right with God. And then maybe God would relent or allow what is a, the oppressiveness uh, to pass by. But boy, this is dangerous ground Daniel's standing on. How do you tell this king this message? Verses 28 through 30. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this great Babylon I have built as the royal residence uh, by my mighty power for the glory of my majesty? Um, he's wanting to avoid judgment, obviously. We all do. He's hoping this thing will pass by. But boy, I tell you, this boy's heart is still prideful. He's on his roof. He's looking at his kingdom. He's thinking, man, look what, look what. I tell you what, Nebuchadnezzar loved him some Nebuchadnezzar. 
He's looking, look, look, he's saying, look, look what I did. He's taking credit for all these advancements and achievements that were really just simply the result of God's grace. God's the one to set him up. God's the one to give him victory and success. And it's just by God's grace, but he refuses to acknowledge that. And he never admitted to his indebtedness to God. Um, and Nebuchadnezzar retained a profound admiration for what Nebuchadnezzar had done. Continue to verse 31 through 33. The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You'll be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You'll eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. And immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Boy, he learned this the hard way. After boasting that all that was done was done by his hand because of his greatness, Nebuchadnezzar finally heard from God. Not in a dream, but in the fulfillment of a dream. Because in Nebuchadnezzar's ingratitude, there was no recognition of God, his grace, and his power, Nebuchadnezzar would now feel the full weight uh, of God's wrath and the fulfillment of God's promise of what would happen that was in line with the dream what he should have learned through the dream of the image what he should have learned through the saving the miracle of the of the three boys in a furnace would now be indelibly impressed upon him and nebuchadnezzar would now live in the elements and the exposure of the area of babylon which is current day iraq now to understand current day iraq has highs of a 110 to 120 degrees and lows below freezing. This was brutal. And he would live like a wild animal in the elements. And he would become actually subhuman. It's an interesting phenomenon called bone therapy, uh, which is, is a psychological disorder. It's pretty rare, but it's when humans believe that they are cattle. And they live out in pastures and eat grass, and it's, it's brutal. It, it, some psychologists say that's usually brought on by dreams. It's interesting that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and, and then experienced this. But he's going through a real, <laughs> to say he's going through a rough patch is, is, is quite the understatement. But watch this. Look how good God is. Starting in verse 34. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. This is interesting. As a cattle, his head is down, chomping on grass. The Bible says in the seven years, his eyes lifted towards heaven. And the moment he looks up to heaven, his sanity was restored. I wonder, I wonder how much insanity we live with because our eyes are down. And if we ever turn our eyes up to Jesus, I wonder what kind of sanity returns. Amen. That might be meddling in too many people's lives. Um... But it, what, what he experienced is the moment I looked up, my senses returned. And then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from one generation to another. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does what he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? By the miracle of God's grace, his senses are restored. And they return to him. And Nebuchadnezzar is aware of all that's happened. aware of the dream, aware of the interpretation, aware of what God has done. And now he acknowledges the reason for his chastisement. And there doesn't seem to be um, any resentment, just complete honesty. And he realizes that God is the one true God. And he lays before God as a sign of humiliation and subjugation and to admit his own power and powerlessness and, and praises God and honors God and glorifies God. Um, in Nebuchadnezzar, I, I, I see four things. Um, 
One, he acknowledges uh, the, God's unending and everlasting power as the ruler of the universe. He realizes his own frailty. Uh, and, and he realizes that because God is the one ruler of the universe, that he will only find meaning in fellowship with that God. That's the first thing he realized. The second thing is that he honors God as the ruler of his kingdom whose reign will never end. That God is the ruler of his kingdom and that his kingdom will never... Regardless of all the other kings that are set up and their kingdoms are destroyed, God is the ruler and his kingdom will never end. All the other kingdoms have limits. They'll be set up and torn down. But God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar realizes that. The third thing Nebuchadnezzar realizes is, is that man is nothing before God. That no matter the boast he may, that no matter the boast that he may make, no matter what titles and acclaim he may garner for himself, apart from God, humanity is devoid of goodness and value. And apart from God, life has no meaning. Humans are pointless apart from God. Now, I realize that would be blasphemy to the millennials who get an award just for being born, but uh, the reality is that apart from God, humanity means nothing. Like, there's no intrinsic value just simply because we got flesh and bone. Apart from God. There was no one who was righteous, no, not one. There's no good thing in me except for what God does and what he produces in him in me. The fourth thing that Nebuchadnezzar realizes is that God has absolute sovereignty and authority over all creatures in creation. That that God, because he has complete sovereignty and authority, that he is answerable to no one. The, the potter does not have to answer to the pot. The, the, the pot does not get to question the potter. Nebuchadnezzar finally realizes that. And verses 36 and 37. At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. My, advers my, my advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became, watch this, even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt the glory of the King of Heaven because everything he does is right. And all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Boy, he knows that all too well. The benefit of his seven-year hiatus was the privilege to continue to rule. His subjects, his commanders, his officials waited for him. It was amazing. They were eager to follow his leadership. One of the things I know is that obedience always produces abundance. In one way or another, obedience always produces abundance. That's just how good God is. I want you to notice something, too, that one of the things I think God was doing here is God was reassuring the Jews um, of his sovereignty, of his power, to give them confidence. And now, just imagine, they're serving as captives in Babylon. Um, they had been in their own land. They had been in the promised land. They had been in the land flowing with milk and honey, but now they're captives in Babylon. They had to have been wondering, is God, this God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, this God, the God of Moses and Elijah, this God, was he truly our God? Was he truly alive? Was he truly able to stand against the pagan Gentile nations? Those nations that destroyed his own city and destroyed his own temple, was he really strong enough to defend himself? And if he can't defend himself, why would we think he could defend us? They had to be thinking that it's obvious to the Gentile nations around us that the God that we believed in and worship, maybe he was too weak to keep us from being uprooted. Maybe he was too weak to protect his own homeland. Maybe he was too weak to protect his own temple. They had to wonder at some point if what they were experiencing currently as their fate was ultimately their fault. 
they had to have been wondering. Was the prophecy of Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 coming true in their lives because they had failed to obey God wholeheartedly and now God was punishing them? Is, was their faith their fault and solely their fault? Was it because of the sin of their past that God wasn't with them in the present? Was it because of what they did in the past that God had removed his blessing from them in the future? It, it wouldn't be unheard of to think of those things because honestly, I've thought those same things about me. And if you're honest, you probably thought about you too. Maybe I've messed up so badly in the past that I'm going to forever suffer the consequence of it in my future. Maybe because of the sin of my past in one area, God's withholding blessing from me in another area. Maybe the difficulty I'm going through right now is because I messed up bad back then. Maybe my fate is my fault. See, these people needed, as do we, a definite demonstration that God is still alive and God's still powerful and God still loves them and he's still with them, just like we need to be reminded of that. They needed to remember that even in the midst of their failure, God's mercies are new every morning. And so God continues to give these ser series of incredible miracles that start to sustain waning faith. See, that's what miracles do. Miracles restore courage. The only reason that a Christ follower could have courage in thinking about or facing death is because of a miracle. Miracles restore courage. The miracle of the resurrection gives us courage over facing death. God knows that miracles restore courage. And he knows that his people needed to know that even in the face of what seemed like overwhelming power and opposition against them, that God was still all-powerful. Even in the face of what seemed more powerful, oh no, God's still in control and he's still sovereign. And they are still his. Family of the Almighty. Family of the Most High God. That God still loved them and God still cared about them that their fate was not completely their fault and they weren't going to live in the fault of their past forever. It's interesting that each of these first six chapters ends with some type of victorious demonstration of God's sovereignty and His faithfulness because He wants His people to know and thereby He wants us to know that He's sovereign and that He's in control and that He loves His people. And there are sometimes he steps in with miraculous means because he knows he has to restore our courage. So God, do that. You've done it before. Do it now. That's Daniel chapter 4.